All right. Okay. You guys ready to roll up your sleeves? Yeah. Yeah? All right. I'm going to have to tell you some stuff, but mostly what I'm doing is setting you up to work with each other to create a path towards the energy transition and addressing climate change. You're going to do it using a simulator that we've created along with the team here at Stanford. Um, so you've got a challenge for the next four days. And I have 49 minutes to set you up to succeed at this. So what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about your challenge, about us, and play with the simulator, and then get you on your computer playing with it up there at lunch on the, pa on the patio. OK? So this is going to be kind of fast. I'm going to try to like, do it pretty intensively. But I think it will set you up to, to win. You guys, I saw some of the presentations this morning. You guys get the urgency of addressing things like climate change. This quote hit me. Swiss, sorry, they're like a reinsurance company. Over the last 40 years, global insured losses from climate-related disasters have jumped from $5 billion to $69 billion in the last 40 years. So this stuff is getting expensive. So like it or not, no matter what you believe about the world, we are going to be getting busy to reduce some of these costs. The reality of the global response so far has been really, really disappointing, you could say. 1990, a bunch of scientists see these colored lines said, here's where emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels could go. We don't know. They made this, these models that said we're going to go a bunch of directions. The black line is what actually happened after the predictions. So here we are going along above the, the worst case scenario. And then you say, well, what happened next? Right? There was a global recession that happened next. So hey, maybe we turned the corner and peaked. Did we turn the corner and peak? No. Boom, big recovery in emissions. You see that up there. And then the last few years have been even higher. So this is a problem that we've been working on, my generation worked on. I've been doing this for 20 years. It's time for another generation to take this. Here's what me and my buddies did for 20 years, OK? Not so hot. Not so good. What did we do? See, you're shaking your head. You're with me? Are you disappointed in my people? <laughs> What is that? You just agreeing with me. I appreciate that. OK, so we haven't done such a good job. What happened? Your challenge over the next four days is to say, well, here's what we actually are going to do in order to get that line. And the, cur the simulator I'm going to show you is going to play out that line for the next 80 years. Where is that going to go? Is it going to go up and up? Is it going to go down? That's what your challenge is going to be. But to tell you a little bit about us, first I'm going to say who we are. What your mission is, you're going to play with the simulator, make your teams, and actually go for it. Who we are. I founded this company called Climate Interactive. And what we do is we make these cutting edge tools to help people see what works to address the biggest challenges of our lives on Earth. So what that means is we build these simulators that are not just for scientists, but are actually for policymakers. So this is Jonathan Pershing when he was the lead negotiator for the US in the United Nations in Copenhagen presenting the results from the model that he ran. So their team actually runs our models. We don't just give them results. Senator John Kerry tried to carry our model into the Oval Office with Obama. You don't bring a laptop into the Oval Office, is what he learned. Didn't know that. John Holdren, who we gave this, the model to, briefed Obama 48 hours before he was in Copenhagen. We've also given our simulations to the Chinese, this team at Tsinghua that helps the Chinese government. And this is used by all the little red dots around the world. We basically gave an open source freeware model to all the negotiation teams around the world. Now we've made one on energy. And we're here to give it to you all to play with. So this is the deal. You're going to be put into teams. And your job is to make recommendations as kind of an energy policy think tank. And you're going to do it on the energy transition and addressing climate change to four people. These are people who are be played by professors. So there will be someone who will be acting like China's ambassador to the US, T. Boone's Pickens, Bob Carr from Australia, and a top Indian advisor. You're going to be making, as a team, present a presentation to them with your path for where things ought to be headed in the energy transition and how we're going to get there. Your mission with your energy transition is to meet these five goals, OK? You're not going to be able to meet them all 100%. 
you have to make a case for, for which of them to meet. First of all, do all you can to get the temperature as low as possible, cl as close to 2 degrees centigrade. That's the goal that the UN put forward to the nations of the world. But also, don't trash the economy, please, OK? Don't trash the economy. Support economic health as much as possible. Address poverty. Equity. Come up with a solution as much as possible that doesn't widen the gap between the rich and the poor globally. The environment. There are other things besides climate that we care about the environment. Don't make a bunch of other problems as you try to address the climate. And then viability. This is kind of mushy. Like It's got to be possible. Not easy, but possible. And there's this language here. If human civilization was working at its best. So don't just sit there and say, oh, that'll never happen. Never, people never agree. They, don't come from that place. Come from, hey, what if we actually had the capacity to address big challenges globally? Come from that kind of assumption. All right? These are all written down, by the way. You've got to have pieces of paper that say this. Your team will go back, but I want to get you the big picture. The rough schedule, today you're going to meet your teams. You're going to go up there on that patio. You're going to eat some lunch. You're going to play with the simulator. And then you're going to have some more time tomorrow. Thursday, you have the semifinals. You present to each other and say, what's the best presentation? That goes ahead to the finals, which is on Friday. Sonny's going to tell you all the specifics of this. But you get this idea. It's kind of set up like um, some sort of sports bowl or something like that. Um, what you're going to present is one slide. One slide. The slide will look something like this. We have a team name. We are called blah, blah, blah. The short version of what we're doing is we think nukes, tax, and GDP change is the answer. The specifics are going to be here. You're going to put your specific settings. You're going to have one graph that's going to show what it is. And you're going to have a result down here. And say, oh, here's my temperature in Greece, 2.4. We're going to give you a template. You're going to have this in PowerPoint. This is the easy part. You figure all this out. You're smart. So let's play with the simulation. This is, this is the part where I'm going to show you some of the mechanics of the simulator you're going to play with. I'm also going to uh, show you a little bit what's behind it. Um, the assumption that we're making, you'll see on the simulator, you've probably heard many of the individual solutions to this challenge. Like someone, things that you guys have heard about. What is a solution that you've heard about? Just call it out. Cap and trade. What's another solution? Carbon tax. Carbon tax. Another one. Energy efficiency. Technology. Some breakthrough technology. Forest. Addressing forests. And then I heard something else over here. So you, you were speaking at the same time as the forest person. Um, I said civilization collapse. Civilization collapse. <laughs> I'll call that um, population reduction, rapid population <laughs> reduction. Population, great idea. OK, so these are all the different things that we're talking about. My concern as a person who likes to fly at 30,000 feet over a problem is that it's a little bit like this. You know the blind man and the elephant? Ancient, ancient story. You know, so there's this blind man. An elephant is like a snake. An elephant is like a tree trunk. They can't see the hole. An elephant is like a rope. An elephant is like a brush. Right now it feels a little bit like, I feel like the fifth blind man. You probably never heard of this guy. An elephant is soft and mushy. Okay. <laughs> If we don't see the hole, then it feels soft and mushy. Let's not feel soft and mushy, people. OK? Let's see the hole. So the simulator that we're going to play with is going to help you put it all together. Not that the work isn't important on just looking at wind and wind strategy, but let's see if we can put all the pieces together between cap and trade and carbon tax and energy efficiency and forests and population rapid reductions and things like that. That's what the goal of the simulator is. This is the simulator. It's on the internet. You've gotten an email that says, here's the link. You go there. You guys actually paid for the creation of this online. We did this a year ago, but it was on laptops. Pretty clunky. Now it's on the internet, so you can just go there. And tonight, if you want to call it up, you can play with it. What the general overview of it is, is that you have input kind of graphs on the left. This is energy demand by, met by source. This is the fuel mix. So here it is. That red line is how much oil between 2000 and 2100. Growing, 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 growing. 
Here's black is coal. It's growing more exponentially. You notice it's turning up, whereas the coal is starting to tip over. Why might the coal be tipping over? Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Why is the oil tipping over? Because we're running out. There just isn't that much. But there is a lot of coal. We're not really running out this century. This is one of the seven points that I want you to understand. I'm calling them the big seven. There's seven things to understand about what's underneath the math of this model. What's underneath the math, one of them, number one, is there are constraints. So when you run a, a scenario and you say, whoa, 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 what's up with that? I'm running out of natural gas. What, what's the deal? Know that built into the model, there's only so much coal in the ground. There's only so much gas in the ground. And there are only so many good solar sites. You can't use all of them too fast, OK? So know that, that there, that's one of the big seven. That's why you see what's going on there. The blue line, natural gas. There's renewables, bio, and hydro in green. This is wind, solar, biomass, and hydro all together. Here's nuclear in yellow. And someone over here mentioned some new technology, some new tech breakthrough. This silver line is a new tech, thorium fission, or something that we haven't imagined yet. But you can throw that in there and say, well, what if? What if we actually do discover such a thing? But in the reference scenario, it doesn't exist. So that's what's going on here. The output is over on the right, annual carbon emissions. Remember that line I was showing you before about saying my generation hasn't done such a great job? This is that line. I showed you a graph which was right here, the last 20 years. But this is it going into the future. The simplest version of what you get to do together is get the red line down towards the green lines. This red line towards the green lines, because this is roughly an 80% reduction of carbon emissions by 2050, which people have been talking about, the scientists have been saying for 20 years, is what we would need to do in order to limit warming to around 2 degrees. Get the red line down to the green line. And the simple version of doing it is you go in here, you move something like someone said emissions price. See this little slider? It says emissions price. I'm going to crank up emissions price. $42 a ton. Why not? 42 is a good number. Run it. Jackie Robinson's number. Brooklyn Dodgers. Here we go. So we're going to run. It went back to zero. Emissions price is zero. It is zero. Good point. So this time, 48. It popped back to zero. Did that happen to Bill Gates? No. Even Bill? He really does want to build a thorium fission reactor. Do you hear? Have anyone heard about this? Yeah. Yeah. He's building one in China. So what I'm doing, so this is what you're going to do when you start it up. When you load up, it's going to take a minute to do this whole setup. So be patient. Don't hit like restart, reload in the middle of all this. What you're going to get in your email is a team email address. It's not a real email address that you're going to type it in here. I'm going to put mine in. But you'll get one for your team. And you can have two people at one time running the simulator. So you'll get a little password with it. And then you're going to log in. And then it'll log in. And then you'll be able to do your runs. So 25 teams, each of you, two computers at a time. But don't, don't use more than that, because you should be talking to each other more than you should be doing tons of runs, actually. So I'm going to try this again. We'll go up. I think 42, I kind of like that number. So we drop it up, pick it up to 42, then we hit run. And what happens is it sends a call over to a server where our simulator is sitting in downtown San Francisco. And then boom, it comes back. So you see the red line moved a little bit closer to the green line. I'm not going to talk about all the policy implications of that. But then you can go, oh, well, actually, that's not enough. I want $71 a ton. The basic thing you're going to be doing is over and over trying a little bit of this, a little bit of that, combinations of things to try to get this red line down into the green zone. Another way to frame it, this is emissions. There are also lots of ways to look at it. Some people like talking about an 80% reduction in emissions. Some people like talking about temperature change. Here we are, instead of going up to 4.6 degrees, this time you notice we're going up to about in there. And what, I can't see exactly what that number is. If you get really curious and you want to geek out on it, see this corner here? This is the button that you hit 
and it turns, shows you an actual table. So if you want to see the specific numbers and not the behavior over time, you click there and it toggles between the two. But the basic idea is play with lots of things, try to get the line to come down. Now one thing you just saw there, is that a little surprising? If you see emissions doing this, what would you expect temperature to do? What would you think? If you had emissions, wouldn't that be amazing if it peaked and dropped and then was slowly rising? What would you expect temperature to do? Just your gut. Slowly rise, drop at least, right? What's up with that? What did temperature actually do? Actually, temperature grows more slowly. So number two, I got a nod in the back. There's some people who, if you've studied anything in the biogeochemistry of the climate, this is not news. It, I call it, it's more like that um, temperature behaves, temperature is like an ocean liner, not a sports car. Not sports car. So you will notice, and I don't have the time to explain all the dynamics of it, but there's these, there are these lags and delays that lead temperature to be difficult to change in the near term because it is a huge global system. And what you're doing, of course, is emissions are going a little bit less. You're piling a little fewer blankets over Earth, the concentration of CO2. And so the temperature is only going up more slowly. It's not actually going down. That's point number two. The other thing you notice, you notice what we had a carbon tax. Things shifted in here. And you may get curious, well, wait, what actually happened? We have a little less oil. We have more renewables. There's a button here that says two comparative graphs. So you can go and check out, well, what actually happened? And this is going to show you a comparative run. The original run is in orange. The new run is in red. It shows you down here. Original run in orange, we have less coal, we have less oil, less gas, right? We have a carbon tax. So all the things that are carbon intensive, you have less investment in those, less capacity, more renewables, bio and hydro, and more nuclear. This is the third big feature of this model, is that all these supplies compete for market share. So you're going to notice over and over the supply is competing for market share. And you'll, you don't just get one without having to supply with something else. So you'll notice those dynamics. What else? Let me see what else you can do. Um, I'm going to go back to more of the mechanics of how the model works. Um, if you like a run like this, do you guys remember what? Oh, it was $71. If you say, you know, this was a good one. I ran it a bunch of times. I really like this one. You hit save run, and you'll want to hit E, so E price, 71. And then you hit OK. And now that's saved as one of the ones you want to keep. You're not going to have time to save every one, because you could do 500 runs. Why not? This one you've saved. And once you've saved it, you can then change it, do another one, and say, well, how does that compare if we were to have this plus something else? Like, What else would we want to add? You see some levers down here at the bottom. You can change things about coal, oil, gas, renewables, new tech, energy efficiency, GDP growth, forestry. Someone mentioned over here the other gases like methane and N2O, an emissions price we already played with. What, what's another thing that we could add besides this emissions price of $71? What would complement an emissions price? Uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Carbon capture and sequestration. Right? This idea, out of the coal-fired power plant, liquefy some of that, shove it in the ground. Hope it stays there. <laughs> so we actually, you'll notice see all these different tabs here. This is where you could go get more specific about population and GDP. More specific about different phases of carbon policy. Land use. You could start in different years. I'm, I'm going to wait till 2030 for land use. Here's where you can change a lot of things that are inside the model that I'm not going to go through at the moment. And then way at the end, you see the CCS input? What we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, we're going to subsidize CCS. And it really fits with a carbon price, because that will favor CCS. I'm going to give it a subsidy. And if you ever get, like, well, what is this thing? You hit the little I button. You see the little information? 
And it'll say CCS is a blah, blah, blah. It costs blah, 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 et cetera. So go hit the I buttons. That's a lot of where you'll understand what's behind things. We're going to start it in 2013. And then I'm going to hit run. So let me see. What did we do before? Did we still have that emissions price? Do you remember? Yeah, I think we did. So we have them. Oh, I cranked it up to 90. Let's not do that. See, that would be changing two things. You don't get to see what the marginal contribution is. So let's play scientists. Good scientists wouldn't change two things at the same time because you can't tease out what's what. And you also hit exactly, set. was it 71? Was that right? 71. OK, so we crank that up, and then we're going to hit run. And oh, before you hit run, actually, the good discipline, talk to each other. What do you think it's going to do? So think for a second before you run it. Don't use this like some sort of answer machine. It's not that. It's not a crystal ball. The purpose of this is to prompt the conversation within your team about your own mental model. So run your mental model before you run my computer model. So think, oh, CCS could do a lot. It could do a little. So run it. So there it is. We, we ran it. It made some new contribution. There's this button that's very helpful, C related graphs. If you go to that, then you go over and it's actually going to show you a bit about what happened. So what happened? Let's see. This is going to show you primary energy demand for coal. And this is a graph of coal without CCS and coal with CCS. So there's coal without CCS. Started in 2013, starts kicking in, and by 2020, it's dropping. And we have a world with most of the coal. So this is, this is a very optimistic future, where we have coal with CCS starting in 2020 growing quickly throughout the rest of the century. So there it is for coal. What's your sense? Did it close 10% of the gap, of the emissions gap? 20%, 30, 40, 50, 5, 2? Throw us some numbers. How much more of the gap did it close beyond what we had with the carbon price? 5, 10, 15. 15. So no one thinks this is a silver bullet. This is interesting. right? The way that people talk about it just note, like you guys are saying 5, 10, 15, but the way it's talked about, if we had CCS, it didn't change the temperature at all. It didn't temperature, it didn't, that's, see, this is, this is important. Let's go look. So over here we have emissions, and this, oh, okay, now we're in something called advanced graphs. See up here? You want to see comparative. It takes a little longer to load, you'll notice. But once you get in there, you get to see a lot more. So emissions comparative. So here we are, you know what we need to do. OK, so we just see what the emissions were. Can you, do you remember? Did that improve much more? It's tough to remember. You don't need to remember. Let's go back and look. So go back here to Manage Runs, and you'll be able to pull up ePrice 71, include that. So you click on Include, and you say, all right, I want to actually see ePrice 71, because now we're going to have Energy Price 71 plus Energy Price 71 <laughs> and CCS with a subsidy of $8 per exajoule, which is, that was what it was. So now, let me see if we can go over to carbon emissions. And I'm going to add a third one, because I think that'll, actually, you know what we need to do is we need to save this. This was, this was E price 71 plus CCS. And by the way, this kind of recording, what you're going to do like a good old scientist, uh, is going to help you. If you ever get lost and you don't remember what you did and you really like that scenario, you're going to go up to settings and you'll see all your settings up there. So we saved it. It didn't change much at all because the emissions price that we had already gave us as much as we were ever going to get. So it really, there's a blue line, I think, that is under there. So it didn't add that much. With a, 90, with a $71 emissions price, having a subsidy didn't boost it any more than it would have done without the, emission, with, without the subsidy. So that didn't actually contribute that much more. Now we could strip away the emissions price and try it again. But my main point is, you see how this works? You try something, you check it out, you see what the impact is, try something again. There's some other things that I want to get to so that you um, Actually, you can see a little bit of it in here that's underneath the model. Under this emissions price scenario, you see this green line through the 2020s and 2030s, it's accelerating. 
that's going on here, that is renewables taking off. And there's a dynamic in the model which is really critical that I want to make sure you guys see. And it is, I'm going to come up in a second, I hope. It is a way that success breeds success. I'm jumping over all this confidence building stuff. We can go back there and I can show you why to be, you should believe the simulator. But um, I want to show you this cool reinforcing loop that I love. Dude, sorry for all this. Uh, it is this one. The reason you saw that green line going up is because in the model there is a reinforcing positive feedback loop. People who are engineers out of control theory, so this is positive feedback loop where, where we have more renewables that we have. So that carbon price would lead us to build more renewables, more installations, more progress down the learning curve. So built into the model, every time you have a doubling of the capacity of renewables, you get a 20% drop in the cost. Get another doubling, you get another 20% drop. That's called the progress ratio. If you don't like the 20%, you can change it. So one of the assumptions and conditions areas lets you change that. That reduces the price more, makes it more attractive, and you go around and around. There's also complementary assets and infrastructure that get built. So one of the other important things in the model, and big seven number four, is success breeds success. And likewise, what do you think would happen to renewables and this loop if we have a lot more natural gas, for example? Success with the natural gas will make the renewables not as popular, is what I just heard. So success with natural gas would make the renewables not as popular or attractive and it doesn't just take away a little bit of market share in one year, it's taking away the strength of this loop over the next couple decades. So it's weakening that capacity. So you'll notice, before I told you there, that there's competition for market share, but it's not just at one point in time, it's taking away that capacity to improve and grow over time. So watch for this dynamic because it's particularly important in the simulator. So let's go back and play with some other scenarios. Oh, by the way, say you get out here and you're out and you're looking at CCS and you're looking at weird graphs and you're thinking, wait, I'm a little bit lost. How do I get back home? Here's some mechanics things. You see over here, this is main graphs. Hit main graphs and it'll bring you back and hit basic controls and then you're kind of at a home base. And if you see a run that you don't really like, then you hit reset sim and you're back home. You're much you're like, okay, we're starting over. Let's try a different strategy. Some of the other strategies that you can try have to do with energy supplies. So you see coal, oil, gas, and they're the same colors as the graph up there. New tech, biomass, nuclear. All of these things will um, change what's in this box. In this box, you can subsidize something. You can put a price on it in any year. You can also have a breakthrough cost improvement. A breakthrough cost improvement is like, what if... Thin cell solar, PV solar gets really cheap suddenly. That will allow you to drop the price really quickly. Uh, this is what we'd imagined with new tech. So someone over here mentioned you know, some new technology. Thorium fission, what if it shows up? It's a little bit odd in this. You'll notice this is described in the little I box. You have to have, we've priced it incredibly expensive because it doesn't exist in the world. So you have to give it, if you want to see new tech, you've got to have a breakthrough cost improvement of like 90 seven percent or something like that and then you run it and you'll see what's your actually what is your sense think for a second how much do you think emissions will come down if in 2020 out of the labs comes zero carbon energy cost competitive with coal spreading around the world commercializes after takes what nuclear took about 12 years to commercialize it's going to commercialize and then it's going to grow how much of that gap do you think is going to solve how much of this problem is it going to solve Maybe half, 60%, other numbers, 20. This is the original purpose of this model. Someone hired us to ask this question to go pressure a very prominent person who was talking about this being the magic bullet. So here we are. Let's watch 
This time I'm going to run it and we're going to watch this time, the, the silver line down here at the bottom. So here it is. It takes off in 2020. It commercializes over so many years. It takes a couple years to build and then it grows radically. Emissions get cut. What is that? 15, 20 temperature. This was disappointing to the people who are the advocates saying this was the magic bullet. Because it doesn't solve as much of the problem. What's going on? What do you think else could be going What What's going on in the system? Why does it not take such a big, what are your theories? Yeah. The other plants are already in existence, so you're going to have to replace those existing plants with this new stuff. This is part of the big seven, nicely said. This is part of the big seven. Infrastructure turns over slowly. What you have is coal, fire, coal, gas, oil refinery infrastructure that lasts 20, 30, 35 years. And it's not until that stuff leaves that the new stuff comes in. Now, there are a lot of places it's growing really fast. But you see all this? We spend this next 20, 25 years with a lot of coal, oil, and gas as it's slowly retiring away and you're waiting for the new stuff to come in. So this is a really key dynamic. And if this doesn't grow until 2040, as you've heard from climate scientists, we need to be peaking emissions over the next 10 or 20 years in order to address the climate goals. So, Whatever can, you could come up with that works now, that reduces emissions soon, that keeps coal, oil, and, the ga and gas in the ground now, helps the climate problem. So one of them is that. The other thing is, imagine if we had zero carbon energy, cheaper than coal, all around the world, particularly in growing emerging economies in Africa, Brazil, in China. What would ch happen in the energy economy as well? What would happen to demand? Demand would collapse. Why would demand collapse? You have renewable energy that is now being used in non-developed countries, which is the largest demand for energy sources. The demand for traditional energy sources. Oh, okay. Demand for traditional energy sources may collapse. Yeah, that's what's going on here. We have a lot less. So traditional, yes. Demand for traditional energy sources would drop significantly. Overall demand, if we suddenly have super cheap energy all around the world, and there are, people, there are countries that are thinking of electrifying more or less, what, is, what effect is that going to have on electrification globally? And people using stuff. It's going to go up. So look over here. I didn't show you this yet. But on the left, besides supply, you can look at demand. And here we have, it's not huge, but the green line is the new run. So in a world with cheaper supply, you can go and look at the overall price of energy. It's one of the graphs up here under all graphs. You can see what is the price of energy. The point is energy, supply, demand, and price are linked in the model. And that's going to be important to notice. Anyone know what the jargon is for this is? Cheaper energy leads to more energy demand. They call it the rebound effect. And a lot of people debate, does it exist or does it not? And the point is, is in, it's going to exist to some degree. And the, in the model, price, energy, um, demand, and supply are linked. Under that energy price scenario, what do you think demand did? Excuse me, emissions price, when we ran that emissions price. Yeah, it dropped. So we would go over and look at this graph, and you would see that it's actually lower. So that's something to think about of what might be behind different scenarios. So this was, this was actually the first surprise. We actually wrote this up because, like many things, it's not a silver bullet. Zero carbon energy coming out of the labs, we're noticing really can't save the day. And there are people who are arguing that it would. So the next point is to see what's behind this. And I want to go back. I'm going to reset this. And we're going to go all the way back to um, the, 
when you go back to basic controls and the main graphs. Okay. Under that emissions price scenario, let's go pull that one of those up. And let's do some other things. Yeah, like emission, just I'm going to run another emissions price and see what happens. This helps a lot, but notice in here these annual emissions drop for 20 and 30 years. But then what what do you see in the longer term? Yeah, it's still going up. And what's overall energy demand doing? Why? Why is it Didn't we just set an energy a, a emissions price? Didn't that kind of turn things around? Why why do we have this? Population? GDP growth? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly it. And where you can see this is the best place to look and see what's happening is go to these graphs called Kaya graphs. There was this Japanese researcher, Kaya, who came up with a very simple equation. He said, well, if you care about carbon emissions, just think about it as, well, it's population times GDP per capita. Multiply these two together, you get global GDP, gross world product. Thank you. You guys, get, yeah, get your, this is the time you're like, you're here, spit it out. You knew it. How many of you guys were thinking that, right? Just say it. So you multiply the two together, you get global GDP. We're going to try this again. You take that and you multiply the energy intensity, which is exajoules per dollar. You multiply GDP times energy intensity, and you get energy. Boom, that was fast. That's the idea. Excuse me. That's good. Kaya said population, GDP per capita, energy intensity. And this is all about energy efficiency, of course. This is, you know, are we successful? And what are the sectoral shifts? Are we moving from more of a manufacturing towards a service-based economy? To what extent? This is all about consumption. This is all about, I was just in Brazil a little while ago, and people want cars. And there are a lot of people buying cars. Are we increasing our wealth such that we can purchase more stuff? Fourth factor, if you multiply the energy and total energy times the carbon intensity, that is tons of CO2 per exajoule, that will give you Carbon emissions, CO2 emissions from energy. So as you step back and squint your eyes at this model, or even at the overall challenge, you could basically say, if someone, if, if your Uncle Harry says, oh, so you work on this energy stuff, you know, like, what can we do? Your list of four could be, well, we can go, how many people we got? How much wealth does each of them have that is energy intensive? What's the energy intensity of that wealth? How much carbon do we use? And then that gives us the total emissions when it gives us temperature. My point in this is that what we did with the carbon price affected two things. It affected energy intensity. Why did it do that? It incentivized, you said low energy intensive? Yeah, it incentivized low energy intensive GDP. It's like, well, we're going to use less of this stuff because it's more expensive now. And I think it probably should show up over here you can see, I'm going to go over to main graphs, and um, yeah, there it is with the energy demand. So it incentivizes people like, let's use our energy more efficiently, the stuff that we do have. I'll go back over to Kaya, and you can see um, that result. So the energy intensity went down, and we saw a huge change in the fuel mix. So the huge change in the fuel mix, and this one takes a little longer because there's so many graphs. You'll notice some delays when it tries to load big things like the Kaya. The main point that I want to make with it is this growth in the long term. What was the thing that was driving the growth in the long term? GDP. GDP. Population and GDP per capita grow strongly, I'll say. So whenever you get kind of confused, like, well, wait, I thought we did all these great things that reduced emissions over the next, in the, in the recent years. Notice and go back to say, how fast are things growing? Because if you have a world of 7 million people going up to 10 billion, you're going to have that core growth. So this is going to be another moment. Back to mechanics. If you run into this kind of moment with the software where it just keeps running and running, you just say, reload.
And we've never done that with, with new software. So go back here. You say, you know what? It is stuck. Let's hit that, reload, and then you get to like reload your model and, and start over and try again. But you're going to remember all of the, the, the runs that you've saved are still in that database. You can go back and check them out. So while this is loading up again, any questions about either the big seven? These are the big seven. And the big seven, actually, one member of your team, write down the big seven. I'm giving you all these slides. I don't think the big seven made it into the slides. The big seven should be the first. If you ever go like, why the hell did it do that? That's weird. I thought it would go down and went the other direction. Go through the big seven and say, these are all important dynamics of the energy system. Are these things that are going on, can that explain what, what we actually see here? OK? Any other questions about some of the mechanics? Because that'll drive where I go next. I've got like 10 minutes or so. Yes? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned like take it easy on the economy um, Yeah. Is there a way where we should like analytically go on here? What a good question. He said, he said, take it easy, you know, like you said, take it easy on the economy, don't destroy it. How can we tell analytically? Of the goals that I gave you, there's one goal that's very analytical and objective. And that is that temperature out there in 2100. How close did you get to two? The other things, thank you, no. This is where through conversation and your interpretation of things, you're going to have to interpret what you think is going on. Some people would say GDP is basically, and GDP per capita is the only measure, you know, like that would tell you. Um, instead, you're going to have to make in, in, inferences about that yourself. In the same way, when it comes to equity, you're going to have to make inferences. You're going to say, well, if we do this, that's going to disproportionately hurt developing countries versus developed countries. Those are things you're going to have to infer because we have not analyzed them explicitly in the model. Yes? Is there any way to you know, set the emissions price at maybe 40 and then change it you know, 10 years later? Even? Great question. The question is, can you set it at 40 and change it 10 years later? So what you see here is the simplest. The good folks here said, get everything on one screen so we can just play. But then, if you want to like get in deeper, see these little arrow things? This says, I want to geek out. I want to open up the hood. I want to go deeper. So I'm going to click right there. And that's under carbon policy. Instead of just an emissions price, then it brings up three phases of emissions price. So you can say, oh, it's going to go, it's going to, go to 40. And after that, because I am king of the world, it's going to grow after that at 2.6% a year. And then even a final target, you can say it's going to come back down. And you're going to hit run. By the way, if it does that, what do you think it's going to do much better? Do you like 40 better than the 71 with the 2.6% with the growth? Yes. This is the kind of moment you've got to run your mental model. You've got to run the one up here before you hit this. Otherwise, you're not learning. Otherwise, you're just playing a you know, pinball machine. Don't play a pinball machine. Use this as a thinking and conversation tool. So that's what we got. It says see related graphs. You're going to want to click on that so you can see what actually is the price that I came up with. So the price that you just came up with, with the 40, see the 40, zoop, over 10 years, and then the 2.6, and I have it leveling off. It's not growing exponentially. So you can sit there and craft the perfect, this is what Ban Ki-moon probably did for weeks around Copenhagen. It's like, ooh, global emissions price. Going to go up, <laughs> down, swooping. Yeah, craft it how you love it, and then try it. OK? All right, more questions. Mechanics or the dynamics? And then I'm going to shift it over to Sonny. And Sonny's going to explain much more about this competition. Where you remember, what you're doing is you're coming up with a combination of all of these that you think is the best way for those four people who I told you about before are going to go, oh, I like this approach. This seems to be a good way to go about it. That's what you're doing. Yes? Can you isolate the effects on different countries or regions? Can we, if, can we isolate effects on countries or regions? No. <laughs> we have another model, which is, which is CROs, which is the one that John Kerry and all those guys used, which is all about different countries. But can you imagine like the energy sectors and 
energy efficiency for the 15 countries. It just turns into an untenable model. So, no. Any other? Yes, in the back. Um, the temperature change, is that like a 50% chance of getting... What a good question. The temperature change, is that a 50% chance of getting whatever that temperature is? Um, you know, I think we actually put in here, I'm going to go into the all graphs. The short answer is it's an 80% chance, and we put in some of the error bounds because you, know, you can't make one line for an estimate that has a wide, wide range of uncertainty. Although if you saw a bunch of lines, it would be much more confusing. So over here under impacts, so what I just hit is all graphs. This is the area where you're going to be able to see all sorts of other things, including temperature change. And oh, I'm so glad that we put it in. Look at that. Temperature change uncertainty. The late Steven Schneider was one of our scientific reviewers for the climate part of this model. And he kicked our butts on this. He said, you must, must put these lines in. And the two lines are a two degree so there's a measure which is, for every doubling of carbon, how much temperature rise do we expect to have? And thank you. Um, we chose three as the sensitivity number. Climatologists love to fight over with this number. But here it is. If it was two, we'd only go here. If it was four and a half, it would go there. So this is the, the likely range. So if you want to go look into that. And this area is also going to show you many other things. Financial. Remember I talked about cost of energy? You can see what is the overall cost of energy. You can go and look at, I don't know, other impacts that you might care about. Uh, ocean pH, sea level rise. So we put some of the other things that are in there that might be interesting to you. And on the front end, there are many other ways to look at you know, how many nuclear units. If you do a nuclear f future, how many nuclear power plants do you have to cite? Dig around, you may find other things that you might be interested in. Other last few questions. Yes? Does the simulation include things like methane emissions from natural gas? Yes. So when you go over to the, the, the gas area, you'll see that there, for gas policy, had its own little special area, which is leakage percent. So if you want to say, well, what if everyone gets their act together, does this amazing job of reducing leakage percent, you say, take that down to one. Or if you say, what if the environmentalists are right and it's much worse than it ever thought of, you crank it up. And we have our own little methane cycle in there. In fact, I didn't show you this before, but these levers are really important over here, right? This is not just an energy CO2 world. Forestry, Indonesia, and Brazil and all those deforestation emissions. And over here is a simple slider that's 0 to 100, where you can reduce methane, not methane from natural gas, but other sources of methane, and N2O and the F gases. So you'll notice this is one of our surprises is that this is pretty high leverage. Yes? What, what sort of controls do you have on population and GDP? And, and what are the short term and long term the GDP with your answer this cover? What you'll notice is if you click over on population and GDP, you could just change overall GDP growth. You click on this button, and it'll say control population and GDP per capita separately. And what this allows you to do is choose between the UN scenarios. So the UN, we chose the middle scenario. So if it's set on two, it's the population which is the middle one. And if it's set on. I press the one on here. Press the bottom button. The one at six as well. So, two is the medium scenario for UN. One is the low scenario for the UN, and then three is higher. So basically, you can change both of them as much as you want if you believe it's going to be higher or lower. Are we? We're switching to another projector. OK. So I'm wrapping up. Are there any last? Oh, more about support. You're going to have this model on your laptops up there at lunch. And you're going to get your group together, and you're going to start playing with it. And you're going to have more questions. I'm going to answer questions. Nick and what's called the A team are going to answer. They know about the model, so you'll ask them more questions. And tomorrow, because overnight you're probably going to have some more questions, tomorrow we're going to be around as well to help answer your questions. And 
The slides you saw are on our website for En-ROADS. And there's a reference guide there that has more support. Um, hopefully, that'll support you to get all the answers you need. Oh, there it is. So this is, here you are. You can change GDP to it up in population. And Sonny, I think it's that time. It's 10 minutes of. That was about the fastest blast from a fire hose intro. Thank you for rolling with it. But from the, the lack of blank faces out there, I think you guys are, are ready to go. <laughs> Yeah. All right. <laughs>